All right, so yes, my name is David Drzejanski. I'm an engineering manager on the Bedrock team at Protocol Labs. And today we're gonna to talk about retrieval compatibility in the interplanetary network. Now that's a bit of a mouthful. And so we're definitely gonna go through some terminology to find some of those terms, talk about why compatibility is important. And also some of the work the Bedrock team has done to improve that compatibility. And at the end, we'll do a recap, look at where we're at and what's coming next. And if there's one thing to take away from this talk, it's that to realize the benefits of compatibility. And I'll be trying to put in highlights throughout uh, the slides of where we get some of those benefits that we've seen so far, um, even though it may be challenging. So with that, let's dive in. So what is the interplanetary network? Um, well, it's really comprised of IPFS and Filecoin. Now, I, I think this was mentioned in one of the earlier talks, the IPFS principles, um, that really helps explain how Filecoin and IPFS are part of the same network. Um, but uh, they are still different. Uh, and so, uh, as most of you know, IPFS, uh, pure peer-to-peer -peer system, decentralized by nature. Filecoin, built on top of blockchain technology, um, which gives it some of that persistence layer of IPFS in terms of guaranteeing the data that you're storing on Filecoin is retrievable. Uh, and is actually being stored. And IPFS tends to focus more on what I would call hotter storage, hotter data, where you're accessing it more for applications. Um, all of these each have their own implementations of clients and node software, Kubo being the most popular one on IPFS, Lotus being the most popular node software on Filecoin. Sorry. Now, Bedrock, as a team, uh, just to give you some context, we're kind of at this unique vantage point where we sit at the intersection of Filecoin and IPFS, and we try to make uh, data storage, data discovery, and data retrieval as performant and reliable as possible. And in other words, making the network that much more interoperable. And we think this is important because it makes it easier to build on the network as well as use the network. Um, so in that set of words that I mentioned, retrieval is the place we want to start. And I'll get into the why in a second, but first let's define what I mean by retrieval compatibility. And I'm just going to read it from the slide. It means data clients and providers are agnostic to the underlying platforms and protocols so that they can seamlessly send and receive data. And this really boils down to two things. Uh, data providers can send data to Filecoin or IPFS nodes, and data clients can retrieve data from Filecoin or IPFS uh, and the IPFS network. Um, sounds simple, uh, but it's a little challenging. Now, why is that important? Uh, we really believe that retrievability closes the loop, closes, <coughs> excuse me, closes the loop on the golden path of the Filecoin and IPFS user experience, where one half of the experience is storing data, the other half is getting that data back. And by getting that data, that is the best proxy we have for people using the network. So the easier we can make retrieval, uh, more the easier it'll be for people to use the network and in, in turn grow the network. And we think that will create a lot of value uh, in the network. And again, we'll see as we um, increase uh, compatibility how that takes place. All right, make sense so far? So Bedrock, uh, again, this unique vantage point where maybe the IPFS team is focused on making <laughs> Kubo that much better, uh, the Lotus team is making uh, Lotus that much better, we take a look at like, well, how can we improve the interoperability? And you quickly go down all the way to the stack, down to the data transfer protocol uh, layer, which is, hey, BitSwap, primarily only used in IPFS, <laughs> GraphSync, primarily only used in Filecoin, they do not talk to each other, how do we make this work, okay? So I'm going to walk you th down this journey that we've had on the Bedrock team uh, to get to some of this compatibility. And remember, we need to solve it for providers and we need to solve it for clients. But before we do that, I want everyone to close their eyes. <laughs> and I'm going to send you guys a CID. It's BAFY834267. OK, open your eyes. How are you going to get that information? show of hands, or just throw out a bunch of answers of like, what would you use to get that data? The gateway. The gateway. Wonderful select, wonderful choice. Any, anything else? 
Lassie, okay, that, that, that is true. Yeah, Lassie's good. Um, but what if, so what I'm trying to get at is that for a long time, it's actually pretty challenging. What if the gateway is down? What if the DHT uh, doesn't have that provider record? What if um, you are not the one who made the Filecoin storage deal and you're trying to get that data back? Where do you even begin to look? Do you have to crawl the whole chain? That seems pretty cumbersome and slow. Uh, and so what, one, what the Bedrock team has done, uh, the IPNI team specifically has built an index for all that information. And we call it the Interplanetary Network Indexer. If you're interested in this, talk, in this topic, by the way, there's gonna be a whole content routing talk. Uh, I encourage you to attend tomorrow. Uh, but the IPNI does one very simple thing, which is a publisher can post content and the metadata around that content as to who is providing that data. So that at the end, so at the end, an end user can look up that CID to know where it is, or I should say, who has that data and how to get it. What protocols are supported by that provider to get that data? Now this is pretty cool because now I know who's actually storing my data and how to get it. Um, and in terms of like the benefit to the network that we've seen so far, it's already helped a bunch of aggregators on the network like web3.storage as well as estuary to be able to scale and serve content to their end users because these aggregators tend to use a combination of IPFS and Filecoin as backup and to be able to track where that content, content is, uh, they use IPNI to do that. Okay, so okay, now we know where, how to find where the data is. Now we can get onto the meat and potatoes Let's build a provider that supports multiple, uh, that speaks BitSwap and speaks GraphSync. Um, so uh, the Boost team on, uh, on Bedrock has built Boost, which is a storage provider piece of software that Filecoin storage providers run that takes care of the storage deal-making marketplace in Filecoin. And what that means is uh, it boils down to storage providers can uh, sorry, Boost can make storage deals and also make retrieval deals of those same of, of the data within those storage deals. Now, previously, uh, Lotus and, and Boost only supported GraphSync, but over the last few months, uh, the Boost team has released Booster BitSwap, an extension that allows them to serve the same content on Filecoin via BitSwap as a provider. Now, this is really exciting. This is for the first time ever an IPFS node can directly get Filecoin content from a, a storage provider directly. And this is a big deal, not just because of that um, compatibility, but because now all of the IPFS nodes in the world now have access to all of this amazing content that's on Filecoin that um, is now readily available by looking it up through IPNI and then going to that storage provider and getting that access. So it unlocks this new set of data that's available for all the users of the IPFS network. Pretty cool. All right, so then uh, the final step is the multi-protocol client. Now we've all heard a lot about Lassie already. Uh, Hannah gave, a, I think, three talks on it already so far today. Uh, it's really awesome. Uh, I'm not gonna go into as much detail, but what does Lassie really do? It abstracts away um, what protocol you're using to get that data from Filecoin or IPFS. And this is awesome uh, because as we've also talked about, um, we've been using it in this project Rhea, the, the, the IPFS gateway, excuse me, uh, that is retrieving content from Filecoin and IPFS when it has a cached miss. Uh, and it's all using Lassie under the hood, uh, which again, unlocks more value for Maybe you don't run an IPFS node, but you run the, but you are a web user that uses IPFS.io. Now you also have content, access to all this content on Filecoin as well. I do want to dive into just one thing about Lassie that I think often gets overlooked beyond all the coolness that we've already seen with the demos is that, okay, even if you, if you didn't have Lassie, but you had IPNI and Booster BitSwap, in order to actually get an arbitrary CID and get the data back, you'd have to jump through some complex logic uh, and probably use three or four different pieces of software to actually retrieve any type of CID that comes across your path. And what Lassie does really, uh, in a really great way is abstracts that all away, compresses it to one simple command, fetch, and it'll just get you that CID. And this is powerful because you as a developer 
uh, on the network. You don't have to worry about something that should be simple. How do I get my data? You can just tell Lassie to go do it. You don't have to worry about it. You can build your application and logic on top. So it really takes away a lot of the uh, developer pain and duplication of effort that used to occur. And so that is the, the superpower of Lassie, in my opinion. All right. So where are we now? Uh, so I've, I've taken you through this whole journey. And now let's see how we did. Uh, so we're a little bit closer. <laughs> we're not fully there yet, but now we have some adapters, uh, some different uh, pieces of software that can talk to each other across both of these protocols, which is pretty cool. And specifically, we've achieved what I've defined as retrieval compatibility. You can see this awesome diagram that shows how this whole network works well together, talking to the IPNI to find out what boost storage provider to talk to. IPFS nodes can talk to each other and find content. Last, you can get content from everywhere. Really exciting. Everything is interconnected. This is amazing. Um, it's all, but you know, it's, it's still early though. So even though these, um, these pieces of software exist, um, they're not fully adopted yet. So to keep us honest, uh, I wanted to share some of the numbers that we've seen from traction and all the metrics that we've been collecting. Um, so for example, Lassie is a critical piece of the Rhea project or the Saturn gateway that we've been talking about. It's serving over 150 million retrievals per week, um, as mentioned previously. Uh, again, there's a whole HTTP gateway discussion or track on Monday, so I encourage you all to attend that if you want to learn more. Um, and about 40% of storage providers are running Boost, and 60% of IPFS nodes are, run, are using the IPNI content routing system as a default. Um, as of version 0 0.18 uh, for Kubo, they run IPNI by default. And in terms of content coverage, uh, IPNI uh, does a pretty good job. So we, with that level of penetration on the storage provider market, we're seeing 45% of deal coverage, which is pretty good. And from all of the query traffic that we see from Rhea, we usually can resolve 96% uh, of, of the queries that are incoming. Now, we obviously want to get this, the, all these numbers to 100%, uh, but it's a pretty good start. Okay, so let's review, um, let's review what, uh, what we set out to do in the beginning, which is retrieval compatibility. So can data providers send data to Filecoin or IPFS nodes? Yes, Boost gives us that capability. Do we have data clients that can retrieve data from Filecoin and IPFS? Yes, Lassie solves that problem for us. Excuse me. But in terms of making the network more interoperable, um, has it been easier to build on the network? Well, we think it has because we've used Lassie to really accelerate the efforts of Project Rhea and that alone has helped um, you know, make a lot of progress in that Saturn CDN network. And is it easier to use the network? Well, I think there's two cases here. One, with Lassie, you can actually use the CLI command and just do Lassie fetch, as people said to look up content. So that's really awesome. And then the second is IPFS nodes now have access to that much more data, uh, specifically the Filecoin content. And so that makes the network easier to use for all your data needs um, in the long run. So check mark there as well. So are we done? No. <laughs> so this is only scratching the surface. Uh, there's way more different areas that we could be adding compatibility. Um, but uh, th these are some of the things that we're looking at in the next few months and quarters. Uh, so for one, we want to continue to push on the adoption curve for Boost, Lassie, and IPNI. Part of that starts with increasing awareness, like talks at conferences like these, as well as blog posts. I believe the Lassie blog post went live yesterday. Uh, and we have plenty of blog posts across all those different, uh, all those different teams that I mentioned, so please check them out. Uh, and so that we can get feedback to to make the product better. Um, now, another way to increase adoption is to really focus on performance and reliability. We've seen um, that you know, as these pieces of software become parts, critical parts of the network in terms of infrastructure, they have to perform at a really high level in order for people to continue to use it, right? So 
um, the more we can make Lassie faster or make Boost faster, uh, and the more reliable it is, the easier it is to attract more people to use Filecoin and IPFS. Uh, but it doesn't stop on just performance. We also want to extend uh, the capabilities of Boost and Lassie, make it more compatible with more protocols. There's a lot of really awesome protocols that we talked about uh, today, uh, like Bao and, and Carmere and stuff like that. Uh, but our team is really um, focused on HTTP at the moment because we think that unlocks a whole another set of developers, primarily like your typical web developer, that can now use um, the tools that they know and love on HTTP and the web and apply that to their IPFS or Filecoin projects. So we think this will really accelerate user adoption as well as enable new use cases like enterprise retrieval that, let's face it, they're not using Web3 right now. So if we can do an HTTP plugin, um, within Lassie, and they don't have to change anything underlying, it just works, we think that's gonna be super powerful. All right, so that's the end of my talk. Um, I wanna say that uh, you know, a lot of this work, I, I wanna give a round of applause to the Bedrock team, because this is a lot of work over the last couple quarters. Um, so, great job on the team. Yeah, thank you. And I've included the GitHub links to all those major projects and the Notion page for the team. Um, if you're curious about learning more or want to learn more, don't hesitate to reach out to me or anyone else on the Bedrock team. We're gonna be here for the entire conference and then some. And uh, yeah, open to any questions either on Slack or in person and, or right now. So what work remains on the HTTP side that is yet to be done or is it just about increasing the awareness of the work that has already been done? Yeah, um, great question. So Booster HTTP exists. Uh, currently what Booster HTTP, well actually this is slightly outdated. So Booster HTTP traditionally was just doing full piece CID lookups, so you get a full piece back. Uh, it wasn't the full trustless gateway API spec that has been discussed previously. So I believe Booster HTTP recently pushed that uh, compatibility, but now we have to do the work of actually integrating it with Lassie and and through the IPNI as well, so that it's a protocol that is uh, is basically a first class citizen, just like BitSwap and GraphSync. Uh, so there's some more work there. Yeah, so that's one of our top projects that we really wanna get out um, this quarter. And then as a plug, I believe the Booster HTTP folks are going to show off that demo at either the Show Intel or Unconference. Uh, yes, so check that out too. Um, because that would be super cool. I think there's a really cool demo where you can see all the files you're storing on Filecoin, and it's like a, a website where you can like see the files in and of themselves, served by booths. Uh, are there any plans to get some functionality of Lassie as a, as a library that you can use from uh, with C bindings, basically that you can use from maybe from Rust or from Python or you know basically the lowest level that you can have a Lassie.so that you can just use. Or is that not possible due to Golang? I mean, everything's possible, but um, no, last year right now is written primarily in Go. Um, I think we, uh, as, as Hannah described earlier, it is a library, a Go library that any Go application can use, um, but we have limited resources, so we had to focus on Go primarily. I think if there's a big use case for C, like maybe, um, but I don't know if Hannah, you have thoughts on that. Uh, so the, the current, recommendation is that if you want to use another language with Lassie, use it through the HTTP server, which, uh, and just run it as a process on your machine, which is not the fastest by, by, by far. Another. There's various other optimizations. Some people are like, well, we'll ship gRPC. I mean, we could do an FFI thing. We could rewrite it in Rust. I'm sure somebody at Vision would give us like a you know, cookie if we did that, um, but uh, <laughs> but um, but for, but those are, that's the state of the state of the affairs. Uh, we'll see where things go. Yeah. 